<clears throat> All right, let's get this started. All right, we're just letting in our participants for today. We'll just wait till the number goes up a bit. Thanks, guys, for coming in. That's awesome. So as people start to join, um, I my name's Shona Reid. I'm the uh, CEO at Reconciliation South Australia, and I've been... Um, have the great honour to bring this webinar to you guys today and thank you for joining us everybody who's joining the webinar um, people gradually come on board and we're really excited by everyone's interest in not only this conversation but a number of webinars that we've had before uh, which are all sitting on our YouTube channel by the way and our website but before we get started uh, it is really important and um, it's uh, something that I hold dear and take the opportunity every time I can is that I'd like to pay my respects um, to the land in which I um, so gratefully live, work, play and grow my children on um, lands of the Ghana people. I am most grateful for that. And I like to acknowledge elders past and present because it's not without them. Um, I wouldn't have the privileges that I do today to live here. Um, and this is even more important because my family from Northern Territory. So I'm very lucky to be able to experience that here today. And also like to acknowledge the expertise, the cultural authority and the wisdom that sits online with us today uh, with our panellists. And um, I... Uh, and anyone else who's on the back end of the webinar that I can't see but um, is watching today, I would like to acknowledge um, you and your role in, in supporting the Uluru Centre from the Heart and the movement that we have. Uh, we might, I always like to make sure that um, other people, people can talk about themselves because I think you are your experts of, you know, your life experience and are the best explanation. Oh, no, back. oh I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Bless the internet. Um, I am going to, um, it's, am I back online, everybody? How long did I drop out for? Like five minutes? No. Um, I'm going to get everybody to um, introduce themselves, if that's okay. I think it's, um, you know, I, I don't know everything about you and I'd love to learn more. Every time I speak to you, I learn more about who you are. But if we can introduce ourselves, why are you online today, your involvement in the Uluru Statement and um, in your advocacy, um, and just share with people on the webinar who you are, why you're on, on camera today. Um, and then we can have, a, after all that, get into a bit of a yarn. So we might start, um, if that's okay. Uh, Dwayne, do you want to lead off um, who you are, where you're from, and why you find yourself on the screen today? Sure, I'm happy to kick things off. Um, thanks, Shona, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Dwayne Coltard. I'm a proud Adyamana Guga, the man from South Australia. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the land which in, I'm uh, zooming in from today. So I'm very lucky and fortunate, uh, as Shona said, to live, work and play in this beautiful area of our country. So um, continue to acknowledge and honour the Ghana people and their ancestors past, present and future. Um, like I said, I, I've been uh, previously uh, involved in these discussions, um, a previous panel, but uh, the Uluru Statement is something that I uh, strongly believe in and is something that I've been involved in in the past four or five years, um, even beyond that. So I think, you know, this conversation is so important and especially when we include uh, First Nations young people who are uh, the passionate mob spearheading this movement. So I think um, acknowledging that and, and building on the, the success of, you know, what we've been able to achieve so far and to make sure that, you know, we, we stay committed and, and stay true to Uluru. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, uh, Keenan, you're next to Dwayne on my screen. Um, can you um, share with us a little bit about who you are and why you're on screen today? Yeah, awesome. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Keenan. I'm a Wirringal Gugula learning person from the far west coast of South Australia. I'm zooming in from the country, so I'd like to acknowledge Ghana people as the traditional owners of where I'm zooming in from and also acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm based in Adelaide now, I'm studying environmental sciences. I got involved through the youth, or through the Uluru Statement, the Youth Dialogue Group, um, through family and friends, Dwayne's one of them. Um, I guess one of my interests was getting involved with the Uluru Statement was more around inclusion. I guess coming from a, like a regional remote area, often mob from those backgrounds aren't often included in these discussions. So part of me coming on board was also about, well, how are we also going to ensure that all our voices are being heard, not just mob that are based in regional and metro areas. Thanks, Keenan. It's great to have you and always love to see you smiling on the screen. Um, Shailen, you're, um, you're new on the screen today. Can you tell us about yourself? I know, it's exciting. 
Um, so my name is Shalem. Um, I'm a proud Nadanjali woman. Um, this is my first panel um, with um, Rekha Say, a Nullary statement, but I did attend the um, the Youth Summer up in Cairns in 2019, along with Dwayne, um, and that was kind of how I first got involved with all of this. Um, I think for me and why I want to be involved is that we do need a plan on how we're moving forward in the future. Um, we've, you know, the government's put in place a lot of things that they just backflip on. So now we need something that's a bit more concrete. Um, and I think having a good group of youth together like this, um, who represent the whole state, like Keenan said, and representing those rural areas is important. And yeah, it's good to be involved and see what we can do moving forward. Thanks, Shailen. Um, and our dear friend Sally, who's been the regular on the <laughs> webinar, the roadshow. Um, Sally, some people might not actually know who you are. Yeah, would to kind of share with a little bit about who you are and what, how you find yourself on a youth webinar? <laughs> I'm still youth. I'm uh -huh. still youth. Uh, so my name is Sally Scales. I'm a Brindanjara woman from the APY lands, um, the very far northwest corner of South Australia. Um, my community people is actually right sort of right on the WA border um, I'm living here on Ghana land and I fully pay my respects to their leadership and acknowledge their connection to this country that we sit on um, I'd also like to pay respects to my elders for everything that they've given to me and their knowledge um, and I hope to continue that on um, the reason I've been involved with the oral statement from the regional dialogues and Duane and myself are actually sort of the original youth, <laughs> as I like to say, the OG youth, um, which was an incredible moment actually at the Uluru Convention where we all got to be together. I mean, it's, it's when we think about consultation processes and um, the way organisations go and speak to our Aboriginal leaders, you know, a lot of it goes to senior authority, which it should, you know, as custodians of this place. But also we need to change that narrative to more, include more young people. And so what happened at Uluru is a lot more young people were involved from all the dialogues and stuff and the regional dialogues. And so we got together and it was so incredible where we sat through and had a chat about what we wanted how we wanted to walk beside our elders, you know, instead of learning about how they got to their processes after they go. And so, you know, really in that partnership sort of space. And since then, the Uluru Statement from the Heart has really made sure that young people are involved because, you know, quite often we talk about the future, you know, the future, you know, we pay respects to the future leaders, but quite often people forget to, include the future now. So, um, and keeping that on and making sure the young people are constantly at the table to discuss things that matter to them, especially around the Uluru Statement is something that I'm so thankful that we've kept up and that I, you know, that Duane and I aren't necessarily young people, but we're still young at heart. <laughs> absolutely. I can attest to that, absolutely. Um, Sally, I might, um, you know, and maybe Dwayne, if you want to jump in as well at some stage. Um, one of the, you just mentioned there that um, you're involved in the regional dialogues and uh, we get a new, um, I suppose, some people might have watched all three series um, prior before, but not everybody would have done that. I think it's really important um, to talk about the development of the statement and how it came came together from um, you know regional dialogues over many, many years and many conversations. And in fact, it's got a Longer history than that. Is everyone still there? Did I cut out again? Hello? Oh my gosh. I've cut out. Ah! Hello? Why is this happening? Oh. Oh, she's back. She's just muted. Um, so the um, the from that sixty percent, you know, was community people who didn't necessarily have an organisational structure that they were a part of, but they were invited because they had leadership qualities or something that the co-conveners had um, seen, and it just invited. Um, the Adelaide one, unfortunately, was around 
um, a showdown. So not a lot of mob came, which was a bit disappointing, but it was still a great turnout for Adelaide. And from that, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, Duane was a part of the mechanisms of the running of the um, regional dialogues, but there was lots of things that we looked at because people think of the Uluru Statement was only four years, but we know that the hardship and the longevity of our working towards that point had been a long time. I mean, Professor Megan Davis and Pat Anderson have been working incredibly hard in all of this stuff. We also know that there's been the Barunga Statement, the Yukala Bark Petition, you know, mob have been asking to be at the table for a long, long, long time, not just around treaties about being heard. Um, <clears throat> you know, even before 67. And so that conversation about being involved and being a participant has been a long time coming and, you know, getting everyone together and going through saying, of course we want treaty processes, of course we want to tell our truth, but we also need to be, have a voice where we can discuss it because while ATSIC had some bad merits, there was an incredible lot of work that went through it that the government just threw away so quickly at... And we see them continue to do that with a lot of spaces and organisations that Aboriginal people put a lot of knowledge into it. And then, you know, another organisation comes wanting that same same knowledge again. Yeah. So, yeah. And, I don't, and just, uh, oh, sorry, just quickly, I'll just follow on what, from what Sally was saying, is um, as somebody who was involved in the kind of uh, mechanics, the, the me mechanics behind the Adelaide Regional Dialogue, um, as a working group leader, um, the, the dialogue started off with this really powerful film and that film really captured this history of advocacy, history of activism uh, when it comes to First Nations people. Uh, and it was very, very cathartic um, a process. I think, you know, the, day, the first day was, was very much about people coming and, and getting off their chest what had been uh, impacting them for so long. Um, a, a, type of meeting like what we had in Uluru. Um, the, the last time something like that occurred was in the wake of Mabo uh, before Native Title. And that was back in 92 in a place, I think, uh, in the Northern Territory, Eva Valley, um, that really, you know, set the, the, the roadmap, I guess, for what First Nations people wanted out of the Mabo decision and obviously later Native Title and what that meant. But I think, you know, for, for a lot of the participants, it was about getting together and actually talking about what issues matter to them uh, and what pathway they believe we should take in order to strengthen and fulfil our future. So I think, you know, we, a lot of the people that attended that Adelaide Regional Dialogue um, are no longer with us. And I would like to honour and pay my respects to those people. Uh, very strong, powerful voices for our community who are no longer here. Um, and I think that in itself tells you that this is big, this is important. We, we, we can't just let it slide. We can't just forget about how much work has been put in to empowering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Mm. Like this is about our empowerment and we cannot simply let it be diluted or shifted away from our original intent. And yeah. that's a common story when it comes to First Nations people is that our agenda is often diluted to fit uh, other people's uh, viewpoints and perspectives. So I think the special thing about the Uluru Statement was it was through the lens of First Nations people. And this was about us setting the agenda, us writing the stories, us being the masters and commanders of our future. Thanks, Dwayne. Certainly, we've certainly been standing on the shoulders of giants um, in this space, and that's certainly um, evident. And I'll, I'll open up to um, Keenan and Shalem, who I, I, I can't about the Cairns trip because there was a youth convention up in Cairns, um, and obviously a youth leadership convention up there. Are you able to talk us through like what it meant to go up there and be part of the South Australian crew that was taking leadership of this, and what the what it was like to be a part of that, and and what it did for you to have your voice in this space um, and providing leadership. Yeah, so I went up there. Um, it was with Dwayne actually. Um, so me and Dwayne went up there with. Um, I think it was maybe three or four other youth from SA. Um, it was great. It was really inspiring to be in that kind of space. And like I said, that was kind of the first time that I had been really exposed to what the Uluru Statement was and what it meant for us moving forward as, you know, as 
a country as a whole. Um, so it was really inspiring to see what other youth in Australia are doing um, and what, I guess, issues affect them because it's what we have down here is completely different from what other youth are facing across the country. And I think it was really important that they did bring us all together. Um, I think they did try quite hard to bring um, youth, different youth together. Um, I think they probably, it would have been great if Keenan came because Keenan really could have given that rural um, insight, I guess. Um, but I think it really put all of us on the same page. And there was probably only 30 or 40 of us, but I feel like I could confidently say by the time we left, um, we were all inspired and passionate about moving this forward and you know some momentum goes up and down I guess but I feel like at the moment um, we're really on the ball with how everything's moving forward but yeah it was just great to learn more about it um, and see you know kind of look into the future at what we are capable of um, and how we can drive that change ourselves. Absolutely. What were some of the um, visionary pieces that young people were talking about up in Cairns? Are you able to, is that secret or we can know a little bit more about that? <laughs> I don't think it was secret at all. Look, everyone was really open about um, what they want to see in the future. I think a lot of us were on the same page when it came down to wanting um, it to kind of be an uh, equal playing field, I guess. We want our history um, to be acknowledged and, you know, kind of want to reconcile the history that people do acknowledge but still don't do anything about it. So it's kind of moving past acknowledging it and then, um, you know, giving reparations and things like that. Um, and we all agreed, you know, a voice in Parliament is really how this country moves forward for us, I think, um, because if it's not a voice in parliament or if it's not you know voice treaty truth then what is it um we did talk about you know some mob are opposed to it because um they don't want to work with the system that did kind of take over our lives but again if we're not going to do that then what are we going to do yep. um there's other ways forward but this is what is working right now and this is what's going to work for our people and i think everyone that was there was on that same page that this is what is needed to move forward and reconcile our past and then think about our future generations as well. Yep. Thanks, um, Shailen. I, I kind of nearly mixed Keenan and Shailen together. But <laughs> Keenan, I'm going to throw to you around, obviously, um, uh, Shailen um, touched on it there, around the priority around um, constitutional voice. Are you able to talk around, um, you know, from your experience and your conversations and your expertise um, in, uh, you know, youth and regional remote areas, the importance of youth and how it's a game, uh, the importance of voice and youth um, and how it's a game changer um, for Aboriginal young people um, across the country? Um, yeah, I can speak from my experiences. Um, I guess because like growing up in Lincoln and Sejana, um, there wasn't, there was really not a lot of opportunities or stuff on for young mob, you know, like once you kind of got out of primary school, like year seven onwards, there was nothing for us mob and then you kind of see that reflected in the community, like mob getting into like wrong things and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of us had to often fight for opportunity to leave or to fight for any opportunity we could get and that often meant coming to Adelaide um, going to uni or doing whatever, just getting out just to get some exposure or some experience, you know. Often mob return back, mob don't return back. Um, what was the question again? Sorry, you know you've gone tangents on you forget. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, of the importance of constitutionally enshrined voice and what it means for young yeah. people, Aboriginal young people in, in Australia. Yeah, because I guess prior to the Uluru statement, there was the recognized campaign. Um, you know, people were a bit sussed on that. I was Are you able to, can you just share with everyone what the recognised campaign was? So, from my understanding, it was a government backed initiative and it was around kind of educating wider Australia around the importance of recognising First Nations people within Australia's, within Australia's constitution. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest issue with the recognised campaign was that it was just going to be um, we push for that, we'll push a referendum to get recognition and then leave it at that. There was kind of no follow through with, um, we'll, we'll recognise them where else do we go on from that? Mm -hmm. But the Uluru statement encompasses a lot more, there's kind of that recognition, but there's also voice and truth. So there's more, there's more attached to it and it's more First Nations grassroots led. Um, recognised, I think anything kind of led by government 
um, without consultation by grassroots mob was kind of doomed to fail anyways. Um, so for me, like, I know growing back up in the country and stuff, like, I don't think there's still a greater understanding with a lot of like black followers around all the restatement, which I think could be done a bit more. Like, I think if you were to go back home to Stuna or something and ask Mob, well, what's your understanding around all the restatement? Mob would probably be like, I don't know, you know, like, I just know they had a conference like in Ulleri, you know? Um, so for me, like, because um, even I've been involved with student politics a lot for university um, and I've been on national kind of um, organisations and, and leadership roles. And a lot of my um, kind of efforts through that were also getting as much youth as involved in these discussions. Like it doesn't necessarily mean do you support it or you're against it. Like as long as your understanding of what the statement is pushing for, um, I think a better place to educate rather than kind of just shove it down people's throats. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. Yep. And just um, to follow on from what Keenan was saying, and I think he raises a good point in terms of young people play a, such an important role in translating and interpreting what is happening in our world, especially when it comes to, um, you know, our elders and our community, because there are certain ways in which we interact as First Nations people, and only we know that. Only we understand those intricacies. So therefore, we, we then take on an even important role, not only for the wider community, but for our own communities to say, do you understand how important this is? Do you understand the impacts that could flow on from this in terms of uplifting our communities and making sure that we actually do have a voice, we have a mechanism that is determined by community about who goes and speaks on our behalf in Canberra. Um, we've never had that power. We've never been given that. So I think that's what the Uluru Statement was all about was, no, tokenism is dead. We do not want tokenism. You can, you, can, you know, rec simple recognition won't cut it. We need substantive reform. And that substantive reform is a voice to parliament and a Makarata commission and a truth-telling and a treaty process. This is, this is the heart of it. But if we do not get the voice right now, if we do not make sure that this step one is not done, then we jeopardise the other aspects of the statement. So I think this is why it's so crucial and, and important to be involved in these discussions to encourage our community, but also to encourage uh, the wider mainstream community to say, hey, do you know how important this is? Do you know why there is so much support for this and why we can actually make this a reality? And say, you know what, back it, when the constitution came into effect back in 1900, 1901, they were talking about Aboriginal people as a dying race. Guess what? We're not dead. We're right here <laughs> and we're not going away. We're going to keep talking louder and clearer about our message for the future because it's too important to give up. And Shailen talks about a plan, you know, this is, this is a plan. And it reminds me of, of the Warumpi Band song, Black Fella, White Fella, and it talks about, do you understand this family plan? Are you the one that's going to be ready with a helping hand? Are you the one that's going to stand up and be counted? That is what we're talking about here. This is why youth-led movements, like the Uluru Youth Movement right now, is so important, and it will continue to gain momentum. We've got to hear here, brother Dwayne, in the comment box. <laughs> Don't get me started. No, watch out. <laughs> thank you. No, thanks. For I will pick up on a few things there as well. Sorry, Shona. <laughs> and Dwayne was saying that there's, um, you know, there is a conversation that needs to be had around, you know, mob out bush in regional communities while they've not you know, necessarily been saying, oh, we want the Uluru statement or knowing what that is, which is also a really thing, like government do that all the time and say, oh, you know, mob don't talk about it, mob don't want it. You know, what we spoke about it at one of our other webinars was the fact that, you know, I might actually put my video on just in case I get cut out again, um, is the fact that for us, we've been asking for some sort of reform or some sort of self-determination because that is our inherent right. You know, as Aboriginal people, we have a right for self-determination. And any time we have an opportunity where we have ministers, we have stakeholders who 
play a part in the runnings of our community, we say we want X, Y, Z. And we're very clear. And, you know, people dismiss that quite often, quite quickly, because they want their own agenda to be heard. With the Uluru Statement saying, you know, it put us at that table because, you know, as Shalom said, you know, going to Cairns for her to see all those young people, it was like every young person had a different opinion and a different conversation happening. We acknowledge constantly our different, the, our different communities have different things that need to go on. The people that don't get that are our stakeholders. <laughs> the people that don't understand that are government. Even you know, elections coming out next year, you know, it'll be like people only need to see the election and see how government treat Aboriginal communities and the way that they have conversations. And it's, they don't actually come and tailor that conversation to us. You know, they think, think oh, what works for Melbourne will work in, in Adelaide will work in APY will work in, you know, Perth, you know, it's, it's everyone's, and it's like, no, 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 you actually need to win us over. And, you know, I'm just going on a little bit of a rant and I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's like when it comes to the, that conversation around the election, you know, and we need to change people's mind and we need to get this over the line is the fact that Labor, who has relied so much on the Aboriginal voice to provoke them in, are actually going along with the Liberal Party in legislation for the Uluru Statement. Now, we know if they legislate the Uluru Statement, that's dead in the ground. They will never move on in any space. And that's not what Blackfellas are wanting. That is not what community want at all. Sally, I was just picking up on that bit. Um, And can you just talk us through a little bit more around why, if they legislate now around a voice rather than going through a constitutional voice, why why it's dead, dead in the water, why Uluru is dead in the water, the statement? Well... A few things. First off, that's not what we're asking. That's never what we've been asking. We've been talking for four years. We want it constitutionally enshrined and that mechanism in place so that any change of government can't throw it away. We saw that with ATSIC, which was the last body that Aboriginal people had in there. And, you know, we see the playing of the games with, you know, the uh, national coags, you know, in there where all of these organisations are at the table to talk about closing the gap where no, nothing is being changed. Um, But around that legislation component is if it's legislated and it works, government will say, well, we don't need to do more. If they legislated and it don't work, government says, see, look, it didn't work. Why would we go through a constitution? That legislation process is sort of like Aboriginal people have to put a performance on before like we have to try they want to try before they buy sort of component and it's like well hang on a minute we've been at this conversation for a long long time we know what works and also there this is the thing that everyone's saying is our last like it it makes sense you know it's our inherent right and a lot of people support it um former high court judges are supporting it all these sort of stuff there's traction on there they just have to do it. Like government have to have a backbone and they've said that they will have a referendum. So let's go to it, you know, but if, if it gets to that point of legislation and, you know, we do, and I said, we really do need to keep them both parties on it because Labor, you're not just, you can't coast along here, you know, politicians and our, our parties have been coasting along and, we know that they're going to use COVID as the biggest sort of a point with the election next year. Um, you know, like, look how badly they failed and look how we would have done it. You know, we can, we can already foresee that. And so it's really about, well, where is our voices on Uluru Statement? Where is our voices on climate change? Where is our voices of, you know, what we want for us and our communities? And I think that's what we really need to play at. And, in any frame of legislative is just quite, it's quite tokenistic. It's also quite, it's not what we wanted. Mm. You know, how many times do we put something on the table, community are putting something on the table and are saying, oh, no, 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 we're doing it this one. Yep. How many times does that have to happen? 
and yeah. it doesn't it doesn't strike at the heart of the historical in exclusion of First Nations people. So before 1967, there was a there was a clause within the Australian Constitution that said other than Aborigines. So so having a legislated voice does not deal with that historical exclusion. Hmm. Does not strike at the heart of the power that the federal government have had since 1967 to be in charge and to actually provide a, a actually roadmap for our mob. But instead, what do they do? Um, we've seen it quite clear in the Hindmarsh Island case and that the limits and the, the unwielding power that the federal government have to then impact our culture, our ways of life, that simply cannot happen anymore. And it's simply unacceptable in 2021 that we are still here knocking very politely at the door to, to hear what we have to say, to acknowledge that our voice is important and that we're going to make this change for our future. Um, eventually, we're going to have to kick down the door. You know, it's, it's the fact that this is getting to a point now where there is too much at stake. Um, we only need to look at, at the recent news about what's happening in our communities, whether it's racism, whether it's close the gap, where, you know, it's, there's too much at stake to simply just say, no, this, we're not going to do this. We're going to go out, going out, going to go on our own way. No, the, the line in the sand has been very uh, drawn very clearly. It's Uluru or nothing. We, we definitely need to get behind the Uluru statement and make sure that everybody's voice is heard. This is why First Nations people and, and us mob need w the wider community to acknowledge the importance of this statement because it's not going to be, you know, it's, it's, we've already done the hard work. Mm. We've, already, mm. we've already done the hard work. Now it's time for you guys to, to take the baton and run with it. And, you know, this is, this is why we are going to continue talking about this issue and making sure that this crucial first step is done right because yeah. it, is, it will lay the foundations for our future. Absolutely. Thanks, Dwayne. I might, um, Shale and, and Keenan, I might throw over to you guys around, you know, you've, you know, obviously um, you've been involved in the Cairns Dialogues or, and the youth leadership space um, around Uluru. What, what is it when young people see the statement? What, you know, this is, this is kind of one of those things where, um, you know, opportunities and aspirations and, and excitement happens for our young ones in this space. What, what are the conversations being with young people around their keenness to get involved into this political space around, you know, our rights-based conversations and advocacy on a national level? Are you able to give us some insight into, um, you know, how much our young fellows want this space? You want to go first? I don't want to go first. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, even through like, my mentoring, so I'm, I mentor at one of the boarding houses here in Adelaide to the First Nations quarters. Um, and often when they engage with especially history topics and Australian studies, um, and they're coming to me and they're complaining that, oh, all we're learning about is um, the American Civil Rights Movement. And um, we did one day on Aboriginal history or one day on, you know, like, and there's been really, fuck all, sorry for swearing, on our history or our shared history here in Australia, and they're learning more about Martin Luther King, which don't get me wrong, was an amazing man, but what about our, our pioneering leaders here in Australia, you know, and our significant events like, um, like in 1938, when it was the start of NATO Week, the National um, Day of Remembrance and stuff like that. Um, so there's this real anger. And then I see these kids get so angry and they're so worked up because they're like, no one cares about us. And so like part of my mentoring role is like, well, rather than being angry, channel that into something. You're, you're learning about civil rights movement in America. See if you can angle in any indigenous perspectives or first nation perspectives here from Australia. Um, even within the university spaces, there's um, this there's, there's huge movement, especially on the East Coast and, and here in Adelaide as well, um, around organizing, getting together the activists, participating in BLM movements, the, state, the Uluru Statement and stuff like that. Um, it's really upsetting though, to see that the higher education bill was passed last year. Um, so which is gonna further um, make it harder for First Nation students to access our own histories. So, um, so there's gonna be an increase in arts and humanities and social sciences degrees. So I think upwards of $50,000. And often when First Nations um, students go to university, often a Bachelor of Arts is kind of, is, is, is a go-to degree because it's stuff where they can often integrate Indigenous histories, studies. Um, and, now that it's going to cost us so much, like triple that of a science or law degree, 
um, is ridiculous because it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's another form of restricting us from accessing our histories from the academic space, you know? <clears throat> um, I don't know, even from my activism, like I've seen really good stuff, really bad stuff. Like often I'll see non-First Nations people when they're really passionate about topics, especially when it comes to environmental activism, they often exclude the voice of the First Nations people. And my thing is, well, if you're an activist also um, out here um, trying to fight for land rights and, um, and for conservation and you're excluding First Nations people, well, then you're just continuing on that colonisation mindset. Um, and as Duane was going on about, that there's not a lot of protection for us as First Nations people here in Australia. Um, we've seen time and time again that our sacred sites um, are, worth, are worth nothing in comparison to white heritage listing sites. Um, even when we had the Intervention Act, which was one of the greatest injustices of human rights in, in, in Australia, and the fact that they could just scrap the Racial Discrimination Act for a couple of months and then do all these atrocious things up in those communities. And even though the intervention has somewhat stopped, it's now continuing on outside of Northern Territory, going to communities like Sajuna, where we have the um, basics card now, and going into other communities where they're saying it's not targeted towards Aboriginal people, but in those towns where they're rolling out these basic plan or these basic card plans, they have a high population of Aboriginal people. So. I agree with Duane and Sally Mob that we need something enshrined in our constitution because at the moment we're actually not protected. They're not even like you look at the um, the Royal Commission into Deaths and Custody, like not really not a whole lot of those recommendations were rolled out. Like they just don't take us seriously or they don't take our concerns seriously. I don't know. I'm coming across as a pessimist. Um, I am hopeful. That's why we're here with the youth. We're pushing forward, but it's also it's very easy to focus on the negative. So I'm here trying to be like, nah, get some hope. Let's do this. We got this. <laughs> that's what the statement does doesn't it it gives us yeah. you know that plan forward it, it's the it's the future calling and the hope that it instills not only the graciousness in which it was delivered but the hope that it instills was that felt Shailen up you know as as a leader in South Australia a young person leader in South Australia and the influence you have is, is that something that yeah. the Uluru Statement's done Definitely. I think when we went to that summit, there was like this huge feeling of hope for our future. I think all of us left that summit um, in really great mind spaces, thinking about what's possible for us as, you know, as a collective, what's possible for us as youth, but what's, you know, possible for our elders and for our future generations, because I think it was really important for us to focus on, you know, paving the way for future generations and making sure that, you know, they're going to be set up to either keep this fight going or to be, you know, doing their own thing, um, hopefully in a country that, you know, has actually implemented some of the changes that we were talking about. Um, and I think it really came down to the fact that this generation um, is, you know, we have social media everywhere, everything, um, we can see everything that happens, you know, um, whenever there's a racist, you know, attack on someone, it's everywhere. And I feel like this generation, because we're so much more exposed to it, um, we're also a, not more on the front foot, because I don't want to take anything away from what any of our um, older people have done, but we've got a bigger platform to fight for change. And we've got, um, more means to actually put that change into place. And I feel like that was the main thing that we got out of that summer up there was the fact that if we don't do this now, um, we're gonna be fighting a battle that just never ends. There needs to be groups of people, especially youth that step up and start paving the way and putting these changes into place, which is exactly what's happening, you know? Um, there are, youth out there, you know, really paving the way like Sally and Dwayne, Keenan, you know, everyone here and across the country that are using their platforms and, you know, everything that they have to make sure that our future generations are looked after and that we're always still respecting those that came before us, our elders that fought this without much of a platform, um, but still did everything they could with what they had. Absolutely. And I was going to, that's a really good segue, Shayla. I'm going to get you on some more webinars. Um, I <laughs> wanted to just touch with um, Sally, you dumped. <laughs> no. Um, 
can I, I just wanted to touch back oh, just on that, Shannon, because that was great. Because, you know, obviously, um, you know, with my, you know, family and, you know, and working with um, mob in South Australia and up north and a whole bunch of stuff, you know, there's always a plan, you know, like, you know, our elders, you know, we talk about things and, and they raise issues and topics and things that are really important, but there's always a plan for five generations back, uh, you know, five generations ahead. And, um so considered in these conversations, Dwayne and Sally, when you were in those regional conversations, did you see that? And, and what did it look like? It's, you know, talking about the regional dialogues around the statement, that plan that they had um, and the elders had in that space and even our elders, you know, who fought for the same stuff 100 years ago, five generations ago, um, their plan was for the future and for the young people. It's always been there. How, can you talk us through what the conversations were and, you know, just to share with the audience some of that? And Sally, um, oh, there we go. I will share myself um, at the Ross River Dialogue because um, as black fellas and as young ones in that space of leadership and constantly looking at our elders and also the leadership that the, you know particularly government and media see um I raised this at Ross River I said you know when we look at that Aboriginal leadership it's all in one age bracket um and I said you know there are so many incredible leaders from our sectors out there and there is a conversation about what is a leader and what is an elder and I think that's because a lot of you know non-indigenous people and especially the media think an elder and a leader is the same person you know whereas I have always have viewed it quite on the same you know two different sort of spaces you know our elders are leaders but they're leaders in our communities in a, a different sort of way um but in saying that you know I've had the great fortune of having so much incredible leadership around me and incredible elders around me and everything, the way I am, the who I am has become because of these leadership, you know, quite often, you know, while I'm in a lot of spaces and now the turning point was all or the turning point for me in my life was 2017, you know, I, you know, it was going to Ross River it was having the confidence to go for APY executive council it was going to that you know to Uluru for the dialogue and that's you know that's when all of that happened all in the same year and it's also when I at the end of that year 2017 is when you know I started to care for my nephew Walter so there's a lot of things that happen where you're exposed there is an exposure that happens as a young person when you get to sit in amongst your leaders and this was 250 in Aboriginal leaders from across the country, not for a march, not for, a, you know, uh, hearing an announcement or anything, sitting down and putting down their hopes and aspirations for the future. Just being in that room was really powerful to have all of those incredible leadership. And, it, you know, it's so unfortunate that a lot of them have passed on. Um, and we, you know, acknowledge their incredible, you know, leadership in that space because they were, they are our professors, you know, of that language, of that cultural um, power and knowledge that they held. But, you know, everyone thinks that, you know, our leaders had this always constantly saying, well, I'm doing this for my grannies. You know, I'm passing my knowledge to my grandkids always. You go to any community and they talk about, you know, who are you doing this for? It's always for the grandkids. And, you know, and unfortunately there's a lot of people who get quite scared about Aboriginal ambition, you know, because, oh, you Aboriginal people are so kind and considered and you're not ambitious. And it's like, are you kidding me? Our Aboriginal leadership are so ambitious. They want more and they deserve more. You know, like look at us in this on this webinar. You know, we wouldn't be here if our leadership didn't weren't ambitious for us. You know, the spaces where we know where we've had a chance to be at the table, where we've pushed the agenda, that's because of Aboriginal ambition and leadership. And 
we need to stop being scared of that. We need to stop going, oh, no, no, slow down. Because that's a real sad thing is that too many times Aboriginal people are told to slow down. Even now we're told to slow down, to, you know, we've got to consider this, we've got to go through it. Our life expectancy is so much shorter than our non-Indigenous, you know, counterparts. Mm. Why do our elders have to be told to slow down all the time? You know, we've they been waiting it, we've for been 230 waiting. plus years. <laughs> yeah. So this is unfinished business. This isn't something that we can simply wait, 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 wait with um, anticipation for. It's something that, as everything with with First Nations mob is, is something that we demand. Nothing yeah. we've been given has ever been handed up to us on a silver platter. And I'll share yeah, this story. magical thing. Oh, black people yeah. get everything for free. Oh, nothing, <laughs> nothing. But um, I'll share a story at the Adelaide Regional Dialogue where a very staunch and prominent Aboriginal woman, um, I won't say her name, but she got up and she spoke very sternly and very angrily about the fact that here we are still talking about things that we've been talking about for the last 50 years. You know, uh, 2017 was the 50th anniversary of 1967. That's what makes this Uluru Statement so important is that for 50 years we've been dealing with the federal government. For over 200 years we've been dealing with the Crown. So I think, you know, it, it was the fact that here we are now still talking about these issues, still talking about how do we actually get justice for First Nations people? How do we ensure that there is an equitable voice for our people? And we aren't just simply going to the, ta- the same tired faces and voices of the past, because guess what? There is a new generation, there is a new wave of leaders coming up who are just as passionate, who are just as uh, educated, who are just as culturally um, um, knowledgeable and wise about their communities who are, who are definitely on the doorstep of, of becoming into that next sphere. But the whole point is we cannot simply rely on what we've done in the past. It's time for change. It's time for a future. It's a future we can all believe in, a future that isn't just about First Nations kids, but it's about all children who should all enjoy the beauty of our culture and our country and our history. Like As much as there is a dark chapter when it comes to the colonial history in Australia, there is a beautiful story of human history, human survival that is one um, part of all of us, no matter where we come from, we call this beautiful place home. Australia is our home and we share it with you. But the whole point is in order to fully appreciate what this beautiful country has to offer, you have to look through our lens. You have to look through our eyes in order to see what, what's so beautiful and so special about this place in order for us to build a future together. Um, you know, and it reminds me of um, Audrey Nunakul, Kath Walker, a beautiful um, um, Aboriginal poet who, who um, wrote a poem called A Song of Hope. And in the, in the last verse, it says, to our father's fathers, the pain, the sorrow, to our children's children, the glad tomorrow. That's all we want, is, a, is, is tomorrow to be bright and happy for all of us. Not one part of our community suffer in silence. That can't happen anymore. You know, it's time for us to actually unlock the voice of First Nations people for this country to appreciate, to flourish to nourish, because that's what's important. Thank you, Dwayne. Here, here. Well done. That was wonderful. Um, absolutely. Um, I just want to, we've got a few minutes left, and I, I want to, the people online today, there's a lot of people online today who I recognise. I've been spying people online secretly while we're talking. Um, a lot of people who are engaged with youth work, youth work in that sector, um, you know, I know that schools couldn't log on today and they want to watch the video later. Um, and that is obviously the greatest, you know, breeding ground for our voices um, and, and uh, you know, the movement making space and, and people finding their way and sorting out some of this stuff in their head. I'm going to go to each of you as we head on out. We've got, you know, just 10 minutes left before we'll wind up the webinar. Um, what is it that we can do as an older group of people um, politely um, in helping um, enable uh, our young people to get engaged in this space? And if you're a young person online, I'm not going to call out who you are or who you are not, um, what can they do to get involved 
in either awakening their knowledge around this stuff or, or getting involved in this type of a movement? What is it we can do to either stop the barriers and enable things to happen or um, to be a part of that change making space? Um, and I might start with um, Shalem, if that's OK. Yeah, I think um, if you're an older person um, wanting to kind of spread awareness about this, um, I think it's just listen to us. You might think because we're young that maybe we don't know what we're talking about or that you are more experienced than you probably are. You've got more life experience than we do as young people, but I can guarantee we do know what we're talking about. Um, we're educated about this. Um, we've lived this, we've worked this. Um, we might be young, um, but at some point you do have to start listening to us and letting us lead the way. Um, because I think no matter who we are, we're gonna do it respectfully. We're not gonna you know, step on other people People's toes. Um, we're not going to try to take over. I think some sometimes you do just have to trust that um, we want the best for everyone, and that at some point you were also this person who wanted the best for the younger generations. But now you're that older generation. So look back and think what did you do at this age? And I think it's really just putting your trust into young people that we do want the best for our future generations and for everyone that's alive at the moment. Um, and I think if you're a younger person, um, it's gonna sound cheesy, but like the world is your oyster. You choose what you wanna be involved in and you choose what your, um, you know, where you spend your time. If you're passionate about these things, then get involved. There's nothing stopping anyone from getting involved in this and spreading awareness about what you want from the world and how you want the world to be when you're an older person, because we're, you know, we're young. We're gonna be hopefully alive for quite a long time. And do we really want to keep living how we're living with you know deaths in custody the you know health implications because if we don't start changing things now and start advocating for change it's just going to be a continuous cycle so it's important that you know young people start pushing for that and that the older generations trust us in you know kind of handing things down to us and letting us take over some of their responsibilities because you know as they get older they shouldn't have all these responsibilities either we're here to kind of take those on board and help them thanks Shalem. keenan um <clears throat> sorry i guess as an older person um obviously what Shalem was saying is listening but also maybe think of or consider consider taking up mentoring roles you know like giving young people the the skills and tools um to be able to do this stuff and do it in a way that is culturally respectful but also in a way that is because through my experience of activism it can become quite um quite draining and obviously ask a lot of older ones that have been involved in the space a lot more longer but there's a lot of work that we do that is just not great for our mental health and it's quite draining so even like using that experience to teach these young ones to do things that are, to, to do activism in a way that also is not going to be um, damaging, I guess. Um, I guess also for young followers is to also acknowledge like the hard work that that our older generations are put in and, and respect the pathway that they have paved and respect them for the work that they have done and give them props. But also for the older mob to acknowledge that there are, there are um, knowledges and skills that they have but also stuff that they don't have that young people do have, and that is terms of knowledge and access to technology and how to use it. Um, but also knowing what's kind of what, like what is happening at, at this time point in life. You know, I guess because we're so interconnected in the world without even being connected, that makes sense. You know, like through the internet and stuff like that. Um, that often that activism looks so different today than it, than it did say in the eighties and seventies. Even from my experiences, like working with like high school students, like I still consider myself young, but to like a fourteen-year-old, I'm old. Um, a, lot, a lot of us were sitting and listening, kind of taking into consideration, like where are they at? What are they thinking? How can I kind of, um, like, if they're interested in doing this, like, how is it and it's going to be in a way that they're going to get the most out of it, also? But um, I don't know. There's kind of no one one way works for everyone, if that makes sense. Um, but I think going forward is working together like back home um, 
for the um the Wurrungal Native Tribal Southern Claims, like all the old fellow, like all the elders on back home during our meeting before we decided to go to present the termination, they just um they all voted for me to be chairperson back home, and that was because they wanted young ones to kind of take on the mantle of these responsibilities and also learn on the go. I guess because they because I'm almost they must be getting sick and tired of you know fighting the same battles over and over again. They're like, no, nah, it's your turn, your turn to learn now, Keenan. You're going to learn, you're going to listen to us, and you're also going to do the work for us. And I was like, all right, fine, I'll listen. I'll, I'm scared, but at the same time, I'm keen. <laughs> uh, Sally and Dwayne, um, same thing to you. You like, you know, how can how can you know fellas play a role in amplifying youth voices, enabling it rather, and, and pulling down some of those barriers that stopped it in the past. Um, I'll go and then Dwayne can finish it off with a flourish. Um, I always say uh, one is tokenistic, two is a change. So if you're going to open up spaces for mentoring, for, you know, someone to join a board, someone to join your organisation, make sure that there's two so that that person has a buddy because quite often we, all of us have been the only black fellow at, in a room. Um, I lose count of how many times I walk into a space and I look around and see if there's any other peoples of different ethnicity groups. Um, or also if there's, you know, if someone else is a woman in their space. So one is one is token, two is a change. So really making sure that you're doing more than just the bare minimum as well. You know, it's and we also do a lot of, you know, acknowledgement of country, but we also need to start doing more in that space is how are we moving it, as individual organisations and people, how are we moving that needle across, how are we ensuring that our communities are being heard. Um, or say if you're a parent or, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean a mum and dad, like if you're a, someone who is in that parental guardian line, have a conversation with a young person who is about to become a young adult, you know, there is going to be an election, you know, this is something that is going to be have to, they, they will have to vote on if we go to a referendum, hopefully, you know, and it's like, well, how are they going to play a part as a young person from a, diff, you know, who is non-Indigenous? How are they going to, you know, pick up that mantle and be counted, you know? So making sure that there is that conversation that's going on and in those schools, in those workplaces, in those family homes, because it's, we are a small percent, um, but we need people to continue to have these conversations. As always, also the Uluru Statement, um, there is a website, there is a letter generator there at the moment to write to the MPs about all of this um, and wanting an enshrined voice in the constitution. Um, but also there is so many daily young people out there who know the social media world um that you can find all of us on you know the Uluru statement is on instagram and facebook and you know all those sorts of things so there's ways of reaching out and if you want to be involved i mean Shona, um hmm. they can contact you know rec say there is a volunteer sort of line there so that's a, that immediate sort of and we'll be in touch and how that would go about. But it's just making sure you keep that momentum, you know, keep it going because, you know, we've done four webinars now and all that sort of stuff. People go back and watch it, pick up new things. I would also say read the Uluru Statement. I think a lot of people have heard about it, but I've not actually read it. And what we see is actually the first page. There's actually a further 18 pages onto it. So there's the... Um, there is the, um, it's on the Referendum Council website. So if you look up Referendum for Statement or even the Uluru Statement, you can see the whole statement and that goes through the dialogues, the conversations, what people were talking about and everything there. So that's, that's something that to really look at. And, yeah, read it a couple of times and sit with it. Not to and mention also, it's, it's in um, translated. translated into all these languages. So <laughs> now there is no excuse. Um, Anybody um, who wants to engage with the statement can in their own yes. mother tongue. Wonderful. So there's a, um, with SBS, we've done a project with SBS where we've translated the Uluru statement into multiple languages, First Nations languages and a lot of um, our other countrymen's languages. So, um, you know, my sister-in-law was so happy for her father can, um, 
you know, so she, he can hear it in Arabic and um, so Urdu and stuff. So that was a proud moment. So have a look. It's all on. Have a quick little Google. Find your young person in your household to find it for you as well. <laughs> yeah. Dwayne, Dwayne, finish with a rush. Dwayne, <laughs> finish with a rush. Um, yeah, well, I guess um, just repeating what um, Shalem, Keenan and, and Sally have said about listening, I think that's the biggest thing is, is actually um, – you know, listening to young people and appreciating that that voice is so important to our future. Um, but also, I think practically, um, we're at a very interesting time in our community, in our country, in our global world, in, in a sense. So um, biggest thing I would suggest people to do is donate money to the cause. Uh, donate money to Aboriginal community controlled organisations who are seriously and severely underfunded and under resourced because they do such an amazing job in our community space um, that I think, you know, sometimes it is about just saying, you know what, I'm going to make a commitment to donate, you know, five or ten dollars a month to an Aboriginal um, uh, cause, um, to uh, Aboriginal organisations, to the Uluru Statement to ensure that we can keep spreading the movement and the message across. Um, but I think, yeah, I think now in this time where we are in a, a transition phase with everything that's happening in our communities, I think that would be now would be the nice time to donate some money. Uh, think about what you can do with your time. What are your strengths? You know, what strengths do you bring? What are your weaknesses? How do you contribute to actually empowering Aboriginal people? youth so um, my, my suggestion would be engage with your local community learn a little bit about what country you're on um, somebody just put a, a thing about children's ground that's a deadly uh, youth aboriginal organization that does amazing work with um, children up in the northern territory so I think you know there are a multitude of, of different um, avenues you can take but keep reinforcing the message that you support the Uluru statement that you believe that a constitutionally enshrined voice is achievable and doable and that you're ready, you've accepted the invitation to the Uluru Statement and you're, you're putting on your boots and you're ready to start hitting the streets because that's where the next step is. And we know, we know from our, our history that, you know what, we, we've done pretty well when it comes to putting on some pretty amazing demonstrations, rallies mm -hmm. and protests. So, you know, we can only continue to build on from that great history of activism that we have. So... Um, yeah, it's just engage, 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 learn. Don't ever think you're the expert, you know, always <laughs> refer to other people and um, viewpoints. Never take it for granted that, you know, I'm Adya Matna, I'm Gugula. This might be something from um, other mob. You know, we're all different. Diversity is, is important. Thank you, Dwayne. Follow us. Follow us here. Follow no, us. Rekha, so, so that, you know, there's when we have more events, more things, we can, you know, tap in and you can Absolutely. see what we're doing. Completely. Anyway. Oh, I've got one more thing. So, you know, we do have teachers, educators and school kids watching. There is a big civic section that sits within your curriculum and the Uluru Statement would be a wonderful civics topic to explore and do inquiry on to understand it a little bit better and get into some of the nitty gritty around the activism. We'll be doing something in that space to support teachers education and learning in that space. But what a great opportunity to explore a current day Australian um, matter of interest for First Nations people here in this country um, and a great way to include kids and learning in that environment. But that's it from us. It's 12 past 12.30. Thank you for hanging on a little bit longer um, and hopefully see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.